Hello everyone, welcome to yours and my favorite part of the week. That's right, it is your online child developmental psych class, and I'm here to walk you through the hottest topics in physical development. So how this will uh, play out, I'm going to kind of walk through some uh, structures of the brain, uh, which will be just kind of largely descriptive in nature, uh, then talk about um, some specific uh, neurological processes, uh, uh, discuss how senses develop. Uh, this uh, chapter uh, included some information on uh, psychological disorders. I'm going to talk about them kind of within a um, neurodiversity framework, and then we'll probably wrap it up with nutrition. All right, with that said, let's jump into it. Beginning with structures of the brain, uh, the brain has uh, two hemispheres, that is, there are two halves of the brain. The left hemisphere controls the right side of the body, while the right controls the left, so it's opposite. So, for example, if you had damage into, on the right side of your hemisphere in some area, uh, that would behaviorally, man behaviorally manifest in issues with your left side, and then vi vice versa, uh, kind of damage to your left hemisphere would impact some kind of behavioral issue or something on the right-hand side of your body. Uh, the corpus callosum is a structure that joins the hemispheres of the brain, that is the two halves of the brain. Uh, this is described as a super highway of neurons uh, that connects uh, the two halves of the brain. Uh, both hemispheres play a role in all activities. If one he hemisphere is damaged, uh, neuroplasticity allows the other region to try and take over. Lateralization, when a function is primar primarily uh, located in one hemisphere. Dominance of one side of the brain, in part, determines whether an individual is right-handed or left-handed. There is no such thing as being right-brained or left-brained, however. So we already talked about the hemispheres, and then basically what we have is this super mega uh, highway of neurons, aka they're just a shit ton of neurons, and they, they are rapidly uh, communicating with each other to engage in kind of a complex, organized task. So although there is this idea of lateralization, wherein uh, some parts of the brain are more active uh, during specific activities and and also uh, like specific uh, brain regions do have kind of specialization but the brain broadly stated works in a very complex highly organized cooperative and and uh, in a network fashion wherein multiple parts of the brain uh, are active during any given task or any uh, kind of <laughs> existence uh, that you have in any given like moment of exist existence Thus, it's more appropriate to understand the brain as this, again, very complex uh, network of uh, regions kind of working together to achieve whatever it is it needs to be achieved. And you can also see this with kind of uh, damage. So as stated, if some part of the brain uh, is damaged for whatever reason, and we're not talking about like, is it the brain? Um, well, I should say it depends on kind of the severity of the damage. So kind of in general, though speaking, uh, when one part of the brain is damaged, other parts of the brain will try and compensate um, for that damaged area of the brain. And you can actually see kind of similar behaviors or similar actions um, um, of people with whatever, I'll just this hypothetical damaged area of the brain, I'll just make up something here. You have a damaged uh, um, um, hippocampus and then other areas of the brain are trying to uh, compensate for it. Well, say uh, then there's, you come into a lab and you do an experiment and then both uh, um, uh, participants who have damage to their hippocampus are able to perform some kind of task um, or perform it as well um, as people who don't have damage to the hippocampus or something uh, very close. And kind of, again, the idea is that the brain is going to adapt um, through this kind of neuroplasticity process uh, and then kind of allow a person to kind of engage in same kind of uh, behaviors or very similar levels of the same behavior, even though different parts of the brains are active. So uh, this kind of demonstrates again, how the brain kind of works together uh, in complex network like ways. And thus when there's damage, other kind of parts of the brain kind of try and pick up the slack. Now they can't always pick up the slack fully uh, depending on the region of the brain uh, damaged and uh, the severity of the damage. But that's kind of a, um, an adaptive process that, um, um, happens on a neurological level. And one other thing, there'll be a couple myths in here that I wanted to dispel. There is no such thing as a right or left brain thing. Again, think of uh, your, your brain as this kind of interactive network-like um, system that allows you to perform kind of complex tasks. Actually, a big hallmark of development is that interconnectivity uh, between parts of, of, of your brain that allows you to uh, perform more complex tasks as you get older. 
The brainstem is the most primitive part of the brain that controls basic survival functions. Uh, this part of the brain you do not want to damage. <laughs> this is why uh, even in kind of a lot of combat sports, you don't allow uh, fighters to hit themselves or hit each other in the back of the head because you can damage the brainstem, uh, which is involved again with basic survival functions, just like breathing and stuff like that. Uh, if you um, cause uh, have severe damage to your brainstem, you are in deep trouble. So would not recommend that. Uh, cerebellum, a predominant role in our sense of balance and enables us to coordinate movement and learn motor skills. When humans experience damage to the cerebellum, they frequently suffer from serious balance uh, problems. So kind of one way that you can, that researchers, especially kind of before neuroimaging technology um, existed, uh, uh, one way that researchers can kind of identify which parts of the brain are kind of specialized to perform certain tasks is you bring uh, doctors kind of interacting with somebody uh, who has damage to a particular part of the brain, so in this case cerebellum, and you're like, oh, my patient is really having uh, difficulty uh, maintaining balance, therefore this part of the brain that is damaged has to be involved uh, in um, uh, maintaining balance. But obviously now we can have a neuroimaging technology wherein we can be a little more precise with that. The cerebrum handles higher functions of thought and action. Moving on to kind of lobes, I, uh, I, occipital uh, lobe uh, is involved with vision. If you bang, uh, if you get banged in the back of your head and hit your occipital lobe, uh, you will quote unquote see stars. This is almost certainly uh, because your occipital lobes, uh, which are involved in vision, become activated when they're banged. Uh, in uh, humans, the occipital uh, lobe uh, takes up a, a more space than, than other uh, primates because humans are primarily a visual um, uh, primate and a species. It's not that we don't have other senses, but we very much uh, depend on our vision. And consequently, as a species, we will have kind of larger occipital lobes than other primates because, again, we, we use that kind of uh, more um, higher rates than other primates or other species. Uh, temporal lobe, auditory information, severe damage to the Wernicke's area results in difficulties understanding speech. After, often uh, speak in gibberish because a person doesn't understand the words coming out of their mouth. So, for example, with someone who has uh, damage to the Wernicke's area, you know, probably stated the, the uh, temporal lobe, uh, when asked, uh, when a participant is asked uh, what the saying strike while the iron is hot means, a patient with damage to this area, that is Wernicke's area, uh, responded in part that, quote, Ambition is very, very indetermined. Better to be good into post office and pillar box, into distri uh, distribution, into mail and survey and headmaster. So kind of the idea here is they're having difficulty uh, recognizing that they are uh, speaking kind of in gibberish and in incoherent ways because uh, damage to Warnicke's area is kind of associated with difficulties in understanding uh, verbal speech. So thus they like, can't um, process the words that are being said. So thus uh, we're kind of more likely to uh, engage in uh, like kind of um, nonsensical speaking and also not, like, kind of not recognize it. Next, the parietal lobe, sensory input. Uh, damage can result in something called unilateral neglect. Neglect opposite uh, side of the body from where damage occurred. The neglect occurs on the opposite side because brain, uh, brain pathways cross over to the other side of the body. So kind of the idea for the parietal lobe, uh, because it deals with kind of sensory input or kind of, sen kind of processing of sensory information. So for example, you have uh, damage uh, to your left uh, parietal lobe. Uh, what will happen is you are kind of... Um, unable to fully process things on the right side of your body. So if you put a plate in front of someone uh, with food on you know, the left and the right side of the plate and say, again, I have damage on my left parietal lobe, I'll be unable or less able to process uh, um, sensory input on my right side. So say I'm looking at the plate, again, I have damage to my left parietal lobe, um, I'm going to not sense you know, it's not going to, that sensory information from the right side of the plate is not going to process. I'm not going to recognize that it's there. Um, so uh, what you'll end up, uh, see happening with like older adults who have this, uh, this uh, who have unilateral, unilateral neglect is they'll end up like under eating because they'll only eat like half their food because they can only like sense their brain is only processing half of the sensory information uh, on the plate. So because they have damage on their left side, they will not eat the right side of their plate. They will only eat uh, their food on the left side and thus maybe uh, under uh, um, undernourished, uh, which can cause uh, health complications. Uh, frontal lobe, uh, complex thoughts, planning, movement, language, and impulse control. Uh, typically thought of like, oh, this is what it means to be human. Like, you know, kind of broadly stated. The amygdala contributes to emotions and moods. The hippocampus processes and stores memory. Severe, severe damage to the hippocampus uh, causes inability to form new memories. 
And these brain regions, all of them do more complex things than this. This is kind of a very, 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 very broad overview uh, of these specific brain regions. Okay, moving on to neuroplasticity, where we begin with a myth that is humans only use 10% of their brains. Evo you can even think this in e evolutionary terms. This makes no sense. Uh, the brain takes uh, so much energy and effort to be maintained in humans, it would make 0% chance that we would just have 90% of this massive energy drain on our heads. Doesn't work like that. No, no such thing. Complete myth. Uh, next, uh, develop the developing brain has plasticity, um, brain's ability to change in form and function. The nervous system's ability to change slash adapt over time. It, it customizes brain to the environment that the child lives in. So uh, you can imagine this as hot plastic that you can mold. And in this case here, uh, what's molding it is the child's environment. Uh, so uh, interactions with parents, peers, uh, you know, society, the community, etc. Uh, much of the development in infancy and childhood is related to increasing slash decreasing neural connections. Synaptogenesis is the formation of new synapses. This is basically uh, connections between uh, different neurons. We'll talk about neurons momentarily. Uh, and then synaptic pruning, consisting of the death of neurons, uh, removes uh, connections that aren't uh, useful. That is, you lose them, or you, <laughs> that is, you use them, or you lose them. You just don't lose them. Uh, ch children in poverty experience lower rates of brain growth during infancy and early childhood. So as stated, we have a neurological process here in which our environments shape who we are. And our environments, again, being parents, our cultural values, our country's values, um, what uh, the rules of society, all of these kind of things, the norms, all that stuff. Um, so um, those experiences growing up, again, shape the form and function of our brain, which can be good or bad, you know, depending on <laughs> kind of the environment. But ultimately, this is just done to survive within uh, your given environment. That's basically the evolutionary purpose here. Like we really don't have that many genes, but what a big strength of like humanity is just like this neurological adaptation process. And during development, uh, uh, new synapses are formed, again, kind of connections between neurons. But interestingly, and what most, a lot of people kind of, uh, or lay people kind of overlooked is this idea of pruning. It's kind of especially in the West because we're like, oh, the more something you have, the better it is. The more neurons, the more whatever, the bigger the brain. Not exactly true here with brains. Really what the brain's trying to do is look for efficiency and complex connections between each other. Uh, so, what they're, uh, so what the brain will do, and kind of especially early on in development, um, is actually have two, uh, have a uh, um, an abundance of, of, of synapses or abundance of neurons, and what happens is through that uh, uh, neuroplasticity um, process, alongside other processes, again such as synaptic pruning, literally what's happening is certain uh, synapses, that is connections between neurons, are removed. They die because they are not necessary to uh, survive in your environment. So thus you use, use them or you lose them. So like your brain is recognizing, oh, the synapse between this part of the brain and this part of the brain, eh, it's not really re relevant to my environment. I'm going to lose that synapse. Now that's super broadly stated because there are literally like trillions of synapses. <laughs> so, but that's kind of the idea here though, is that the brain is specializing um, its uh, the its form, its functions, and the spe specific connections in response to the environment. So it's not that just that the more the better, but this kind of adaptive process and that that, and that um, uh, speed in which that, the, that different parts of the brain communicate with each other in very complex network-like ways. And one reason why children in poverty experience uh, slow, uh, have slow rates of brain growth is because uh, you know, nutrition, pollution, also um, uh, just kind of classic things associated with poverty, super stressed out parents, less kind of like enrichment uh, kind of in their house, all kind of contributing to neurological delays in development. But depending on the delay, there are uh, opportunities for catch-up growth, um, especially if you have like a, you know, community programs, school programs, or something along those lines. And I do want to circle back around to synaptogenesis real quickly. So again, the brain, uh, so the brain is recognizing, oh, these two, again, super broadly stated, oh, these connections that connect these parts of the brain together are very relevant to my environment. Therefore, I'm going to strengthen these connections. I'm going to build new connections between these parts of the brain uh, based on kind of this, my environments uh, around me, the feedback I'm getting from my environment. So again, environment very you can see environment playing out in this uh, neurological process and we've already talked about that genetic process as well in previous chapters now let's talk about some principles of plasticity 
Uh, these are kind of interesting because I do not teach these in any other class. So this is uh, really the only place you're going to find this. Um, for beginning with the experience expectant programming brain development, this occurs because the brain expects certain events to happen. It's driven by experiences common to all members of the species. And that occurred during a sensitive period, maybe critical period of development. This is not about variation in normal development. This is the species, evolutionary speaking, expects something to happen, and it has to kind of happen during this sensitive period of time or critical period of time. And if you don't get it, you're in trouble. Okay, so the brain is primed to receive certain types of stimulation from the environment and retains the pathways used to process that stimulation while pruning away others that are not used. So this is an example of pruning. This is just a way of saying that pruning, again, that uh, your environment is, um, or I should say, uh, uh, within your environment are certain factors that exist that are going to uh, activate certain parts of your brain or certain, and then certain uh, connections within your brain, those, uh, those uh, synapses. And then the brain kind of retains the synapses that are most used and then kind of prune the ones that are not used again, kind of for theoretically optimizing your adaptation to your environment. But in this case, again, it's kind of, there is a species wide specific need. And if you don't get it, you're in trouble. So some classic studies include kittens, visual processing development, the species expect access to the visual world. If the expected visual input is not present, the eye develops normally, but the part of the brain that processes visual information does not function. Kittens can never develop vision in that eye. So the kind of the idea here is that as a species, kittens, they expect to like uh, process visual information in the world. They need that, they expect that to happen. Um, and if it doesn't happen, they will never regain uh, the ability to process visual information. That basically, that visual information has to happen. It's um, within a specific period of time. And if it doesn't happen, the brain will prune it away and then you cannot get that vision back. That cat is blind in that eye for life. And that is exactly what some experimenters did. They literally, um, well, you could either uh, neurologically make a cat blind or you could just kind of cover their eye. This was like 50, 60 years ago. Um, so another uh, example of this, is a uh, congenital uh, cataracts. Thus, it's recommended to remove cloud uh, clouded lenses from human children before eight, two months of age, I should say. So again, uh, f um, humans have an expectation that there's going to be certain visual information present uh, for them uh, within their environment. And if they don't get it, then <laughs> that, that um, uh, kind of part of the brain or kind of networks dealing with that visual processing information will not develop, won't happen. And then the kid is arguably going to be blind for kind of the rest of their lives. Thus, you, thus why it is recommended to uh, remove those clouded lenses before two months of age, AKA before kind of the sensitive period uh, ends. So the quicker you can kind of address that um, um, blockage kind of, of, of visual information, uh, the uh, better it will be for the child. Some other, a short list of experience expectant features of the environment might include access to a caregiver, adequate nutrition, sensory information, so not just visual, but auditory and tactile, cognitive stimulation, and linguistic input. These are all things that a human species expects to happen, and it has to happen within a certain period of time, or there's going to be long-term damage associated um, with or scratch that kind of underdevelopment of those uh, features uh, within with, within that human that member of the species, and you will not be able to fully catch back up. There's no catch up growth, or there's very limited catch up growth, I should say. Conversely, experience dependent programming uh, in brain development more individual and depends on each person's particular experiences. May not have to be during a sensitive period of development. Classic studies include violinist violinists violinists. Yeah, yeah, there's that uh, speech impediment. Uh, typically use their left hand to play the instrument and the right hand uh, stay stationary. So the right motor area of the brain, uh, which controls movement of the left hand, um, is going to be larger in violinists than non-musicians, because again, kind of things are uh, inverse. So uh, because uh, you're using your left hand uh, to play the instrument, uh, right uh, areas or uh, right motor areas of your brain are going to 
either be larger or just kind of have uh, more uh, synaptic uh, connections between each other, which reflects the, the more connections there are, the quicker this thing is, uh, that kind of activity or that task can be completed. It allows for basically speed um, and increased complex communication between that parts of the brain and other parts of the brain. Also, another famous example, a portion of the hippocampus is larger in London taxi drivers than in non-taxi drivers, and especially large and experienced taxi driver. So AKA the, lar the longer you engage in that taxi driving, um, uh, the more uh, synapses and maybe the possibly the larger hippocampus is because you're using uh, that part of the brain. So basically what experience dependent is doing is saying um, your programming of the brain or your development of the brain is dependent on uh, your kind of everyday experiences. So it's not that it's expected. Everybody is not expected to be a taxi driver. Not everyone is expected to be a guitarist or violinist, whatever. But um, these kind of uh, neurological shifts uh, depend on your experiences within the real world. And thus, kind of um, those experiences in the real world will be reflected in um, the level of, of synapses and the complexity of these synapses and also possibly the form uh, and structure of particular brain regions. And this does not have to happen during sensitive period. Like the taxi drivers, we don't have baby taxi drivers, for example. <laughs> um, this could happen uh, later on in life. Granted, there are sensitive periods throughout the lifespan, but this is not directly, thought to be directly tied to a sensitive period. The differences between experience expectant and experience dependent development are not always crystal clear. One dilemma we face pertains to how one defines a normal expectable uh, ex environment. A second consideration has to do with both expectant and dependent processes playing a role in the same domain of development. For example, developing language likely depends on experience expectant processes, hearing language being spoken to, while which language one develops depends on the language one is exposed to. Similarly, it may well be that the formation of an attachment relationship reflects an experience expectant process and an experience uh, dependent process. Because our species young cannot take care of themselves, an assumption is made that there will be a caregiver to take care of the offspring. And once infants are of age, typically associated with mobility, they will organize their behavior around seeking and maintaining proximity to their caregiver. However, as we are well aware, there are enormous individual differences in quality of caregiving, which is related to ways that infants uh, pattern proximity seeking and maintenance. Thus, the way that attachment is organized may reflect an experience dependent process. So we kind of have uh, a couple uh, issues here, or kind of a, qu a couple questions, I should say. One, kind of identifying what is expectant within our species. Uh, some things are going to be uh, quite obvious, like nutrition <laughs> and language. We're very uh, communicated species. We're a social species. We have language. Um, uh, but also kind of disentangling what parts of maybe the same developmental outcome are expectant and which parts are dependent. So kind of as stated, uh, receiving language input and learning language is expectant uh, for humans. That is, it's universal. It's uh, the species as a whole, genetically, through thousands of years, expect this and, uh, to happen. And there's a sensitive period. And if you do not have any language input during, those, uh, during that, uh, that sensitive or critical period, you uh, are going to have underdevelopment of kind of your language capabilities across your lifespan. Kind of the same thing with attachment, or I should say, no, let me expand on that. So we have that um, uh, sensitive, um, or I should say that expectant component of language, but at the same time, the specific language you learn is going to be experience dependent because uh, there's no universal expectation of humanity uh, from a, you know, whatever, I'll just make up something 300, uh, like 100,000 years ago that says, you know what, English is the expectant language of all species, of all, of, of all humans. No, we have a lot of languages, many languages died out, and guess what? There will be new languages in the future. So we have, so language development contains both expectant and dependent processes. Kind of same thing with uh, attachment. Uh, it has an expectant uh, element because, as I've stated throughout this class, hu uh, baby humans, they ain't doing nothing. They're laying around, they're crying, they're <laughs> like nothing. Uh, they're using that time to adapt to their environment, like again, through synaptogenesis, plasticity, etc., uh, epigenetics. Um, but 
this process kind of is uh, allowed to proceed like safely, evolutionary speaking, because the species expects that there will be a caregiver to take care of the child as, it's, as the human baby is going through this rapid period of development. Um, uh, but at the same time, um, although that it is expectant, that there's that attachment, that there's a caregiver, that's kind of the, at the root of attachment. Uh, at the same time, the uh, quality of the caregiving, the quality of the attachment is going to be different. Um, there's going to be uh, high quality of parenting, low quality of parenting. There's going to be cultural differences in parenting. And that is thus kind of reflecting experience dependent processes. So kind of trying to unpack that, unpack that can be a little difficult uh, depending on the developmental outcome. Next, and this is not covered in the book, I want to talk about it anyway because eh, it's kind of more of my theoretical leanings, uh, experience adaptive de development. Uh, this uh, kind of mode or, or way of programming, so these are referred to as programming, you kind of almost think of it like a computer or in your, the environment and your interactions are programming your brain. Uh, this implies our experience uh, adaptation uh, applies that the particular form of brain development, both structural and functional, is shaped by the specifics of experiences during a relatively sensitive phase of development in such a way that there is an optimal adaptation to the specifics of the environment. Early malnutrition is associated with an increased risk for later coronary heart uh, artery disease, hypertension, and diabetes because the programming has been for low nutrition and not the richer diets encountered in adulthood. The finding is particularly interesting from a developmental point of view because the correlates are the opposite of those found in later life. That is, although early malnutrition is associated with an increased risk of later coronary heart disease, in midlife, the risk comes from overnutrition. A theoretical notion is that the organism is programmed to deal with undernutrition and that it is thereby maladaptive to deal with later overnutrition if that is what is encountered in the later years of life. So kind of the idea here is that um, we have this plastic uh, development and our brain uh, is going to uh, be shaped and it's going to adapt to the, specific of the, uh, to the specifics of the environment. So you can imagine there's malnutrition. So you're growing up and there's malnutrition around you and, you're, and uh, your brain is being programmed, again, broadly speaking, uh, your biology is being programmed to say, um, or in light of the fact that, hey, there's no nutrition around you. So biologically, this is telling uh, the developing organism, aka the developing child, hey, you're going to grow up in an area of food scarcity. So therefore, I'm going to program your brain like you're going to have low nutrition your entire life. So thus, your biology, your kind of a digestion and all these other complicated uh, biological process are going to be prepared for a low nutrition life. However, say when you're 30, 40 years old, you uh, move to another country or you make a lot of money or your country changes. And now all of a sudden, say, for example, you have a bunch of fast food around you or maybe you have access to more uh, nutritious food. And now all of a sudden, your kind of biology that was adapted or, you know, uh, programmed to meet the specifics of a uh, under uh, a malnutrition environment now is like unprepared to deal with an overnutrition environment. Thus, maybe you're at risk all of a sudden of obesity or and um, other kind of um, uh, over caloric uh, kind of um, negative developmental disorders uh, or developmental outcomes, I should say. So thus, early malnutrition is associated um, with an increased risk of car coronary artery disease from overnutrition because your body, again, uh, biologically speaking, neurologically speaking, genetically speaking, has been programmed to be adaptive to that environment. Now you've shifted your environment and now your body is not, uh, that adaptation is not gonna serve you as well in that new environment. So the same adaptation can result in kind of different developmental outcomes across the lifespan and it could be more adaptive or more optimal adaptive in one environment, but not so much in a different environment. Now let's jump into some specifics about uh, neurons, how they communicate, what they are. Uh, the brain uh, functions by sending electrical uh, signals across circuits of interconnected cells called neurons. There are also biochemical processes such as hormones and neurotransmitters. Uh, we're not going to talk about this, but uh, we're going to look at the electricity part. I do have other lectures uh, if you're interested in kind of the uh, neurochemical part of it. Um, but continuing on, neurons, these are just nerve cells. There are approximately about 100 billion neurons. So a uh, lot to study. Uh, the cell body is referred to as the soma. This is the center of the neuron. It builds new 
or renew cell components. It is where the nucleus of the neuron is located. The dendrites are branch-like extensions that receive electric information from other neurons. Like receivers on phones, they listen in to other neurons and pass on information to the cell. The axons, or the tails, of the neuron that spread from the cell body and transmit electrical information. They can be several feet long. They're like phone transmitters. They send messages to other neurons. So as you can see on the figure on the right, uh, kind of the idea here is uh, you can kind of think of this as like a phone. This is kind of the metaphor that I generally work with here, uh, wherein the dendrites, kind of those branches, kind of tree-like uh, looking things, uh, they are receiving information from other neighboring neurons. So that's basically, uh, so another neuron is, our, is ne uh, next to, we'll just say neuron one is what we're focused on, um, is uh, neighboring neurons around neuron one are activated. Neuron one's gonna uh, receive that kind of electrical or receive that electrical information uh, from its dendrites and say, oh, I'm gonna be activated too. So then what happens is through, a, through that process of, of neurons uh, connected to each other, um, activate in complex ways and allows you to, which allows you to, uh, you know, perform a certain task. So we got the dendrites, they're receiving information. And then we have the exons, which are sending out information. They are sending messages to other neurons. So neuron one receives information through its dendrites from other neighboring neurons. It, then that neuron itself releases electronic uh, information, which travels along the exon, which then spreads out to other neighboring neurons, uh, dendrites. And then you start that process kind of over and over again. And this is going very, very, very quickly. This is like millisecond situation. And again, we have 100 billion neurons. So there's a, a bunch of electricity going on and rapid communication. You can actually measure um, uh, uh, the electricity emitted off of neurons, um, even just by wearing like this kind of like cap it's called EEG, and there's other kind of variations of it. But you can uh, you can measure the electrical activity of, of neurons. And why that's important is you can say, oh, the neurons in the hippocampus, um, their activity, their electricity has increased while completing this task. Therefore, completing this task must be associated, or the hippocampus uh, must be associated with completing this task. And again, I go into a lot more detail in my lifespan developmental course and to kind of my uh, uh, ad uh, adolescent and adulthood class for um, uh, neurons. So if you're interested in that, check out those uh, lectures. Moving on to white matter, it provides support and protection for neurons and includes a fatty substance called myelin uh, that surrounds the exons of certain neurons, myelination, the process through which the brain circuits are insulated with myelin, which improves the efficiency of information processing occurs throughout adulthood, different brain regions at different rates. So kind of the idea of myelination is uh, this is also impacted by your environment. So it's not only do new synapses uh, develop uh, through kind of your interaction with the environment, but also the rates of myelination also increase. And myelination uh, uh, allows for very, very, very rapid and efficient uh, processing of information and communicating between different neurons and thus kind of different regions of the brain. And, and increased myelination uh, occurs uh, throughout, um, especially early childhood development, but also throughout uh, the lifespan. So again, it's not just like the more the better, but the efficiency and the speed of communication uh, between these neurons, in this case through myelination, is critical uh, to human development. So you can think of it uh, as, uh, or how it thinks, uh, or how myelination uh, increases speed, uh, like hopscotch. So you can see on the right-hand side that uh, the uh, neurons exons are kind of wrapped in kind of like this blanket kind of situation. Now what happens is the electrical signals from the soma jump from one part of the exon to the next little uh, little node that they're called. So the, the gaps in between those blankets, that myelin sheath, is what the electrical signals jump across. And that, that jump, you think of it like a, I don't know, like a Mario game or something like that. You're hauling ass at that point. You're jumping, jumping, jumping. Now, what happens for uh, in, in people with a multiple sclerosis, that is MS, which is an autoimmune disorder, this involves a large-scale loss of myelin sheath uh, on exons throughout the nervous system. The resulting interference in the electrical system prevents the quick transmission of information by neurons and can lead to a number of symptoms, uh, such as dizziness, fatigue, loss of motor control, and sexual dysfunction. It's like a phone signal becoming hopelessly scrambled, and there is no current cure. 
So on the right hand side, uh, for those with the uh, slides, pull up your slides, um, you can see kind of damage to those myelin and sheaths. And what happens is now those neurons or that electrical signal from the neurons can't cleanly jump in between those nodes. Again, those gaps between the blankets, the myelin sheath, uh, and thus kind of the signal gets lost among the exon. And then neurons are unable to communicate as efficiently or as like kind of productively as before, which can uh, is uh, visible through another uh, through a number of symptoms as stated, dizziness, fatigue, loss of motor control. So your myelin, uh, so people with multiple sclerosis uh, typically suffer from kind of large scale loss of myelin sheath. Next, we're going to talk about uh, neurodiversity, but in the context of autism. And to do so, I have to introduce kind of a theory of mind. Uh, this is uh, described as the ability to think about other people's thoughts, understanding that people have mental states such as desires, beliefs, and intentions, and that their mental states guide their behaviors. Uh, one way that this assesses is, is through a task called the false belief task, uh, which, uh, which assesses the understanding that people can hold incorrect beliefs, and these beliefs, even though incorrect, can influence their behavior. So some minor background about this, there's a whole debate of what theory of mind is, is it even real, um, and is theory of mind measured only through this one task? That is the false belief task, which is kind of the overwhelming way to, to measure theory of mind. So other people are like, yeah, maybe this exists, but also this is just kind of like one task and you should be measuring it through multiple ways for various reasons, which aren't necessarily for kind of understanding uh, uh, what we're going to talk about right now. But kind of the overview of the task is there's always two characters and I always forget their name. It's like Sally and we'll go with Sally and Anne. I don't know, Sally Sue or something. I don't know. So, but there's two characters. Uh, Sally and Anne, okay? And basically what a, a, a child is kind of watching a video of this unfold or kind of being, and or being verbally explained. So whatever, they're watching like this movie or watching someone perform this task. So there's two characters, Sally and Anne, right? So Sally for is playing with a toy and Sally leaves the toy um, on the couch, okay? Then Sally leaves the room. Next, Anne enters the room and Anne moves Sally's toy from the couch to a secret toy chest, okay? Now, uh, Anne leaves the room. And what happens is, and uh, then what the researchers will say is, uh, when Sally re-enters the room, where will Sally look for the toy? And kind of the idea here is you have to understand that Sally does not know that her toy was moved. Uh, only the person who's watching this unfold does, okay? Uh, so kind of the idea is you're taking the perspective of, of the uh, character in the show, aka Sally. So she, you have to understand that she would not understand that her toy got moved, uh, and thus she would look for her toy on the chair and not in the toy box or wherever it was moved. And kind of the classic findings of this research is that uh, autistic children uh, will, because they're quote unquote unable to understand the perspective of others or the other's mental state, they'll say, oh, uh, Sally is going to look for her toy in the new location, aka Sally is going to look for her toy in the toy box. So they're going to assume autistic children basically is what this research is saying is stating is that autistic children are going to basically project what they know onto someone else because they don't understand that their mental that Sally's mental state is different than their mental state. So they're projecting their knowledge that the toy got moved onto Sally, even though Sally would not possibly know that because she was out of the room when Anne moved her toy. And based on this, you get a whole host of conclusions of mind blindness, social deficits, male brainness, all kinds of, frankly, quite negative ways of framing of autistic people in kind of very dehumanizing ways. Uh, there are a lot of issues with this research, and there's actually a lot of new uh, researches that has come out uh, concerning autistic uh, children and adults. Uh, a lot of it is actually um, uh, conducted, or new research is conducted by autistic researchers. Uh, a lot of it is actually in the UK. Uh, our uh, cousins in the uh, Anglosphere in the UK, uh, their autistic research, I would argue, is kind of more um, humane <laughs> and kind of uh, more uh, kind of dissenting from kind of a, the old school uh, autistic research. And what uh, new research uh, suggests, and you can see uh, one uh, within the slide now, include other uh, research 
as well uh, as I continue to break this down is that uh, this kind of failure of, of theory of mind is not consistently replicated which suggests that this is not some kind of universal finding and kind of this very deficit oriented understanding of autism is is at uh, at worst scientifically inaccurate and um, as we will see kind of has developmental uh, implications and consequences for autistic uh, uh, people. So one uh, different uh, uh, interpretation of autism is this idea called the double empathy problem. And this is from one of these autistic researchers in the UK uh, called Damien Milton. You can check him out on Twitter. A good follow if you're kind of interested in this kind of research. Uh, the theory of the double empathy problem suggests that what people with different ex with I should, okay, let me uh, restart. Uh, the theory of the double empathy problem suggests that when people with very different experiences of the world interact with one another, they will struggle to empathize with each other. This is likely to be exacerbated through differences in language use and comprehension. Recent research has found that in experimental conditions, non-autistic people struggled to read the emotions of autistic participants or form negative first impressions of autistic people. Such evidence would suggest that the dominant psychological theories of autism are partial explanations at best. Building on this a little bit before we break it down, uh, according to this theory, uh, these issues are not due to autistic cognition alone, but a breakdown of reciprocity and mutual understanding that can happen between people with varying different ways of experiencing the world. If one has ever experienced a conversation with someone who does not share a first language with, or even an interest in the topic of conversation, one may briefly experience something similar. This theory, that is the double empathy problem, would also suggest that those with similar experiences are more likely to form connections in a level of understanding, which has ramifications in regard to autistic people being able to meet one another. So uh, unpacking this a little bit, so kind of the idea here is that there may kind of be different ways of communicating and understanding some, uh, uh, social communication uh, in autistic uh, kind of versus uh, non-autistic people, again, kind of broadly stated. Um, and these differences in communication and kind of just overall kind of experience in the world, it can kind of cause breakdowns in communication. Now, interestingly, and again, uh, kind of full disclosure, kind of my biases here, my uh, partner uh, kind of uh, works with kind of this theory. Uh, she, her research specifically is kind of looking at um, if autistic and non-autistic people can, um, uh, or how they describe the behavior of autistic uh, uh, people. So basically what she has them do is, is watching a cartoon where the character is, uh, the main character is autistic and she has autistic participants come into the lab and she has non-autistic participants in the lab. She has them uh, go into an fMRI machine and then she has them watch the video and also then kind of describe what happened in the, mo what happened in the movie, what the main character was experiencing, uh, kind of breaking it down, right? And then um, analyzing if, if there's kind of differences in kind of neurological activity and kind of a, um, the interpretation of the event that is occurring. And this is kind of in light of the fact that some research has found that non-artistic non people have difficulty understanding um, and interpreting uh, kind of the uh, thoughts, the feelings, the behaviors of autistic people. So it's kind of a, uh, a kind of a, a dual kind of breakdown and in interpretation that is going on. Not that there's just a social deficit, that this group can't do anything, it's all negative. Uh, they have this male brained issue. It's, uh, traditionally, autism is really thought to be like a male kind of disorder kind of thing, uh, which research, new, new research does not support. And not only that, there are implications in develop, uh, uh, for development. So kind of going through this uh, abstract briefly, again, kind of a relatively new study. And again, you can see all these studies are relatively new. This is kind of a kind of new counter push uh, among uh, autistic researchers who kind of take a more humane uh, approach. So, uh, or I should say researchers who study autism and then uh, specifically autistic, uh, some autistic researchers uh, themselves were also uh, studying autism. So these uh, authors argued uh, that, the, that, the, that there's a link between bi being uh, misperceived uh, by the neurotypical majority and uh, risk of poor mental health and well-being in autistic people. And kind of through this misconception uh, and kind of just the general negative uh, view of aut autism, you know, broadly stated, uh, this can create separation and indeed isolation from mainstream uh, society, which is associated with uh, various uh, mental health and physical health or negative mental health and physical health outcomes. Because now we are all social creatures. Uh, uh, you've been kind of disenfranchised from society. You're socially isolated. You're misunderstood. This is going to have negative developmental consequences. And then finally, a couple other points that I will uh, make before I move on. 
is that umbra autism is very much a kind of an umbrella uh, diagnosis. There are kind of many different behaviors associated with it. There is not just the one autism kind of thing. Um, there, so there's various uh, behaviors associated with autism. And also I want to present this idea of called masking, AKA, uh, which uh, one possible reason why boys get um, uh, diagnosed with autism at higher rates than girls is because maybe their behaviors are going to be shown, uh, their autistic kind of behaviors uh, will be shown differently. And this is going to be rooted in kind of like how gender norms and uh, genders are expected to communicate. So we've seen this uh, throughout this class already. So kind of the idea again, maybe autistic women are more likely kind of to try and internalize those or mask and hide um, their behavior at higher rates than boys, which in general, as we've talked about for various reasons, have more ex kind of externalizing symptoms. So basically what could be happening is that researchers look at boys and they say, oh, look at this externalizing symptom. Oh, therefore only boys have autism to such an extent that they call it an extreme male brain. Well, again, this new research, AKA masking, uh, challenges that uh, assumption. And this is just some research. If you're interested in others, uh, feel free to reach out to me. We're going to jump ahead to senses and beginning with uh, vision in infants uh, begin and uh, specifically visual acuity. This is the ability to perceive detail. At birth, it is 40 times worse than adult. It improves to about 2120 vision in the first month uh, that a child is alive. This is equivalent to that giant E on the top of the vision chart. Uh, vision blurry uh, in unless within one foot of the infant. Um, so really kind of newborn babies uh, very early on, uh, you know, until like four, uh, that, uh, you know, at least the first month of age and even four month age, they still struggle. You can see uh, the image on the right hand side. They're really not seeing much of the world. <laughs> they're just vibing. Um, uh, they're, uh, you know, they're depending on other kind of senses, smell, uh, touch, um, hearing, uh, you know, it's not that they can't see it all, but it is very, 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 very blurry, especially in newborn babies. Uh, visual accommodation, ability of the lens of the eye to change shape to bring objects at different distances into focus, and this kind of improves uh, with age. This is one kind of mechanism through which uh, visual acuity improves as an infant uh, develops. Color vision is present at birth. However, uh, they, uh, inf uh, newborn babies cannot discriminate some color differences. Uh, sensory receptors on the retina are not yet mature. Newborns can perceive uh, light and dark objects, focus on nearby objects, and see simple patterns. So due to uh, kind of um, parts of their um, um, visual processing not being yet developed, uh, they cannot discriminate between all colors. So this is why some newborn baby toys uh, have certain colors or certain patterns um, at least kind of some toys do because, uh, the kid can't even perceive it. <laughs> it's, they can't discriminate between the colors. They can't tell the difference. And a lot of times as I showed in the previous slide, they can't even see it, but they can discriminate between some colors, tell the difference between light and back and see uh, simple patterns. The hearing system is more developed than vision at birth. Preterm babies, that is babies before, uh, born before 37 weeks of gestation uh, are at risk for later attention and language problems, uh, possibly due to the underdevelopment of auditory system, uh, among other, uh, uh, numerous other issues, but one link is this underdevelopment of the auditory system. Uh, how does hearing work? Uh, moving uh, air molecules enter the, air, uh, enter the ear, so air molecules enter the ear and cause the eardrum to vibrate. This vibration is then transmitted to the inner ear uh, and specifically uh, the cochlea uh, there. Uh, those vibrations are converted into electrical signals that the brain interprets as sound. So the brain uh, um, um, converts these air molecules, or, or I should say, these air molecules cause vibrations in the brain. These vibrations in return uh, um, are converted to electrical signals. And then it's kind of almost like that neural, neural process wherein um, electrical signals are being used and other biochemical processes are being used to communicate communicate um, and interpret uh, sounds. Interestingly, preterm uh, pre uh, infants who are exposed to womb like sounds such as a maternal voice, heartbeat and intestinal gurgles and neonatal uh, intensive uh, care units develop larger auditory cortexes than preterm babies who listen to standard sounds. So kind of the idea as we've talked about before is that uh, preterm babies, especially like 80 years ago, if you're born, you have a far more likely chance of dying than what you do today. We can keep you alive, but still uh, you're still at risk. So uh, kind of um, one method uh, of kind of artificially allowing uh, a preterm baby to kind of d develop um, areas of their brains associated with uh, auditory processing is 
by uh, exposing them to wombs that they would hear, or sorry, sounds that they would hear within the womb. And some research suggests that preterm infants were exposed to these womb-like sounds uh, while in neonatal intensive care units, uh, develop uh, larger auditory co uh, cortexes or more kind of rich uh, synapses within the uh, auditory cortex than those uh, preterm infants who uh, listen to standard sounds. So kind of trying to mimic uh, that uh, womb experience in preterm babies who otherwise are going to kind of lose out on X amount of weeks of that uh, auditory uh, sensory information. Young infants show a preference for speech over non-speech sounds. Newborns recognize vowel sounds from their native language they were exposed to in the womb. Researchers gave newborn uh, babies pacifiers fitted with sensors connected to a computer that delivered auditory stimuli when sucked. Uh, infants in the, in the foreign language group, that is the Swedish group, sucked on their pacifiers more than infants in the familiar language group. So basically what these researchers did was give newborn babies uh, from two different, uh, we'll say an English speaking uh, set of babies, so whatever, they're from uh, the United States. And then we have Swedish babies who are speaking Swedish. Uh, we gave them a pacifier and uh, that pacifier is hooked up to this device that is able to kind of calculate the force in which the baby is sucking on the pacifier. And what the researchers found is that when the uh, auditory sounds are, um, or the speech that is heard is the newborn baby's native speech, that is the speech they're exposed to the womb, uh, they will suck on those pacifiers at higher rates than being exposed to a language that they were not exposed to uh, in the womb, that is their non-native language. This should kind of suggests Again, you kind of have to infer these findings a little bit. Uh, you can't really ask the <laughs> one day old baby. Um, this suggests that um, specialization and the development of language occurs prenatally or begins to uh, develop prenatally. And to expand on this, humans are biologically capable of learning any language with development. They become uh, more sensitive to their own language. At seven months of age, children show no differences in brain activity in response to sounds from infants' native language. 11 to 12 months old show greater brain activity to their uh, native language. So what you can do here is uh, put some uh, measure the neurological activity of an infant. Um, um, and uh, you can do this by presenting them with two sets of sounds. So somebody speaking English, so in this case, say our baby is English and they, whatever, they live their uh, entire life slash prenatally and however old they or however m months old they are have heard nothing but English. So let's say our English baby is uh, presented with an uh, uh, English speaker uh, talking and then another time, whatever, and then five minutes later is presented with audio of a Japanese speaker speaking Japanese. Um, and then we have another group of seven month old or seven month old babies or six month old babies. Uh, and this group is Japanese. And again, the Jap these Japanese infants are exposed to a US American speaking English and a Japanese uh, a person speaking uh, Japanese. Okay, and then you can measure the differences in brain activity uh, to see if uh, or the extent to which uh, an infant's uh, uh, brain has been specialized to process Japanese or English. And what they have found is that at seven months of age, there is no difference in brain activity and response to sounds from a native language. However, once that uh, child hits around one year or one years old, there is greater brain activity when they hear their native language. So this is telling us that uh, although humans can biologically learn any language, this is experience expected, through time, um, and um, so just interacting with the world around them, uh, they become their brain becomes specialized to process information in their native language. Which, but that takes time, and you can start to see differences in brain activity um, based on the language they hear, that is their native language or their non-native native language, around that one-year-old uh, marker. Uh, this study found. So, most aesthetic senses. This is the sense of touch, temperature, pain, and in aesthetic sense, premature babies who are systematically stroked over their entire body gain more weight, more, uh, are more relaxed, and more and engage in more regular sleep patterns. Newborns are sensitive to warmth, cold, and pain. Pain is responsive to learning. Infants who have, had, who have already had their heels pricked show a larger response to having blood drawn than infants who have never had it before. So kind of the interesting study here is, again, preterm babies who are systematically stroked um, uh, uh, um, are more likely to develop physically and kind of have um, uh, more relaxation. So this is kind of suggesting that this 
touch is an important part of development. So in this case, especially for preterm babies, this study. Uh, so kind of that touch um, uh, associated with physical changes, that is waking, which is necessary for preterm babies, uh, and kind of a sense of relaxation and calmness. Yeah, so I mean, interpret yeah. it as kind of a marker of overall increase in well-being among a uh, premature baby. And then uh, stated pain is responsive to learning. So basically the infant can learn uh, that, oh, when my heel gets picked, uh, pricked, eh, I don't really like that. So I could, um, or I should say, so they get pricked again, and this time they kind of have a, a larger reaction to it because they understand it on some, you know, biological level or a rudimentary cognitive level, understand it that, hey, this has happened to me before. I don't really like it. I'm going to react to it more. First is it an infant who has never had uh, the prick done before, uh, thus has not like kind of learned about, hey, I don't like this yet. Infant taste. Babies can distinguish sweet, uh, bitter, and sour taste at birth. They show a preference for sweets. Flavor preferences are highly responsive, uh, responsive to learning. Eating the food makes us appreciate it more. Greater exposure to a variety of flavors during infancy may lead to more venturesome uh, later life eating. So kind of a couple of ideas here is that uh, as infants interact with foods more, uh, their preferences can change. They can learn new food preferences. So kind of eating the food and it's good, we like it. Oh, it tastes good. I'm going to appreciate it more. I'm going to engage with this food more and be kind of more open to it. So there's some research that, that suggests that, uh, that uh, exposing infants to a variety of foods uh, kind of predicts later uh, adventure some eating, aka uh, you're not going to be 40 years old only eating like uh, chicken nuggets get some mac and cheese. <laughs> maybe expand that diet and maybe that's uh, uh, predictive, at least partially, uh, but kind of by uh, early uh, exposure to a variety of flavors and interacting, food, interacting with food kind of in a uh, fun way. Reflexes. These are unlearned and involuntary response to the stimuli. So before we kind of had reactions, touch and taste, uh, hearing, uh, you know, recognizing your native language. Uh, this is all kind of ex experience-based. Here we have reflexes, again, unlearned and involuntary responses to stimuli. Uh, survival reflexes, they uh, are thought to have an adaptive value. That is, they are needed to survive, such as eye blinking and sucking. You don't learn how to blink your eyes, you just blink your eyes. Uh, primitive reflexes, uh, these are suspected to be remnants from evolutionary history. So for example, what adaptive advantage does fanning toes when a feet are stoked a stroke half. So we have survival reflexes that are needed. The species is kind of wide. We all have to blink. Um, uh, sucking is required for maybe breastfeeding or more con or teething or something along those lines. But we also have these primitive reflexes that really don't make a lot of sense. So if you like uh, uh, stroke a uh, uh, infant's uh, feet, uh, they will uh, fan out their toes, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like, why is this reflexive? Why do all like all infants do this? Uh, this is probably rooted in some kind of evolutionary history from thousands of years ago uh, that may have served some kind of purpose then. Next, locomotion is a vital aspect of development. It involves movement from one place to another. This allows uh, children to engage with the environment and access to new environments slash affordances. You don't really need to know that term uh, for the purposes of this class, but just kind of uh, new opportunities to interact with the world. Uh, infants acquire gross motor skills before mastering fine motor skills. That is, for example, they're able to kick their legs uh, before they're able to write the alphabet or just broadly stated, engage in precise motor movements. It follows the cephalocodal uh, principle and proxy um, medistal uh, principle, uh, uh, one uh, biochemical or neurological process, I should say, that is involved with these principles is, and specifically the principles of locomotion, uh, is uh, myelination between neurons of brains and muscles follow head to toe. Activities involving the trunk are mastered before leg activities. And the trunk is the kind of stomach in the back. So kind of that center area of the brain or of the body uh, before uh, leg activities. So uh, kind of in general, uh, locomotion, very important, allows us to interact with the world, see new things, interact with new people. Uh, and then uh, kind of there's a process to this where an infant's at first, you know, you have them a crayon and they're just out of control. They can't, they don't have that fine motor movement yet. Uh, so they're able to uh, engage in gross motor skills before fine motor skills. Um, and some of this uh, is why, or some of the reasons why is through these uh, two principles rooted in particular neurological developmental patterns, wherein development takes place um, from your head to your feet and from kind of the middle of your body uh, outward. Thus, 
uh, it takes a little time for um, um, for uh, infants to engage in fine motor movements because they don't have the neurological capacity to do so yet. So through time, uh, um, uh, myelination associated with neurons in the brain and muscles uh, will reach kind of like uh, higher levels of myelination, again, that increase efficiency and uh, which allows for greater network activity to engage in more complex behaviors. So not just thinking, but also physical movement. And then eventually moving from the middle or the trunk of your body to your legs. So that takes time as well. So due to those principles, you can might have, you can kind of move around like your midsection. Uh, you can kind of kick around your legs and grow in kind of gross motor skills ways. But those precise movements take time due to these principles and uh, myelination as well, and a couple other things. But that's fine. Wrapping up with nutrition, uh, there has been uh, different trends in uh, breastfeeding in the 1970s. Only one in four mothers nursed their newborns. This was a low at the time in the United States. 79% uh, of new mothers in the U.S. breastfeed. 49% uh, are still breastfeeding by age six months of age or six months of age. Uh, numerous advantages of breast milk over formula. Uh, studies have found fewer ear infections and respiratory tract problems for children, lower risk of ovarian cancer and early breast cancer for mothers. For premature babies, breast uh, milk has been referred to as, quote, more of a medicine than a food because it has a positive effects on the immune system and weight gains. Young women, uh, poor um, uh, mothers, and those with less education are less likely to breastfeed than other women. So kind of we have like trends of kind of cultural acceptability of breastfeeding that can happen for various social and economic uh, reasons, political reasons that, that occur. Uh, we have seen an increase in breastfeeding since the 1970s. Uh, and as stated, uh, breastfeeding is, is associated with a numerous uh, positive health outcomes from the child and the mother. Uh, for preterm babies specifically, uh, this um, breastfeeding, breast milk, um, um, increases the effectiveness of their immune system. And actually you see this with, uh, even with COVID recently, where in um, mothers are able to pass uh, around, uh, pass uh, intergenerationally, uh, some uh, positive effects associated with taking the COVID vaccine to their children, um, both uh, possibly prenatally and also through uh, breast milk. Obviously this is still early on research. And classically, uh, just uh, the uh, more disenfranchised you are, the less likely you're going to engage and uh, breastfeeding for a whole host of reasons, ranging from economic reasons to biological reasons, like if it's like a team mom or something like that, or uh, more difficulties uh, breastfeeding. The Clemson University uh, Cooperative Ex uh, Extension, based in Clemson University, uh, recommends not feeding infant solid food until the child uh, can uh, sit, sit up without needing support, can hold his head up without wobbling, shows interest in food others are eating, is still hungry after being breastfed or formula fed, is able to move uh, foods from the front to the back of their mouth, is able to turn away when they have had enough. And wrapping it up with malnutrition around the world, uh, global South countries are at increased risk for two types of malnutrition, also referred to as wasting sometimes, uh, infantile marasmus. This is starvation due to a lack of calories and protein. Children who do not, who do not receive adequate protein lose fat and muscle until their bodies can no longer function. Babies who are breastfed are much less at risk of malnutrition than those who are bottle fed. Quashia core, after weaning, children who have diets uh, deficient in protein, also known as, quote, a disease of displaced child, often occurring after another child has been born who, have, who has taken over breastfeeding. This results in a loss of appetite and a swelling in the domino, uh, abdomen um, as the body begins to break down the vital organs as a source of protein. So here, for both of these, uh, forms of malnutrition or types of malnutrition, we kind of see an, um, a lack of uh, nutrients uh, in, in the infant, uh, lack of protein in the infants, and this is going to have uh, negative um, health consequences. And as stated, this is um, an increased risk uh, within uh, kind of uh, global south countries or um, countries who have not gone through industrialization, however you want to phrase it. Uh, Quashia core, for example, is like typically not found at all in the first world or global north or industrialized countries, however it is you want to phrase it. And some differences include Erasmus is thought to occur maybe before uh, one years of age, where uh, uh, Quashia core is uh, closer to like one and a half years of age. 
but he, again, both kind of made it to malnutrition. Uh, I have uh, personal experience uh, working with uh, women in the Democratic Republic of the Congo who, you know, just are so malnutritioned that are under, uh, so poor that they can't afford food. So they would eat kind of this, uh, there's a, a Swahili word for it, but kind of just like a dirt like clay, to, uh, which obviously is not going to provide the mother or the child kind of proper nutrition. Uh, that's kind of another like, direct way in which uh, poverty um, can impact uh, people uh, around the world. I will say, though, that even in the U.S., about uh, 1 in 10 or 1 in 9, depending on the study, uh, our uh, children in the United States are at risk of hunger. Uh, we do have some social programs, again, macro-level things uh, that kind of address this. Food stamps, again, I'm going to call food stamps, uh, but it's not a lot of money. Uh, you can't buy a lot of stuff with food stamps, but also like free lunch programs, something along those lines. Um, but And also uh, some some students, I received uh, free breakfast as well, if you're you know even poorer, um, which uh, can kind of help reduce this, uh, these um, conditions from developing or just hunger in general from developing. All right, everyone, uh, on that somber note, um, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you have a great week. Uh, bye.